In the times of uh, Hugo Grotius, the Dutchman who is famous for advocating the freedom of the high seas in the early 17th century, people thought that the oceans were so vast that their resources could not be depleted. And even when more and more human activities polluted the oceans in the centuries to follow, the common perception was that the capacity of the water to dilute harmful substances and to cleanse itself was unlimited. So it wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that the protection of the marine environment from pollution was recognized as an uh, international uh, objective of importance and urgency. Ocean pollution does not know any boundaries, but it affects us all in all parts of the world, regardless where the harmful activity occurred or who is responsible for that. So despite international and national efforts to prevent and reduce pollution of the oceans, a lot needs to be done to improve and enforce existing law and to consider whether new activities, such as the storage of sequestered CO2 on or under the seafloor, should be permissible or not. So what do you think are the major sources of pollution of the marine environment? Most of us will think of large oil spills or sh from ships or accidents like the Deepwater Horizon blow-off in the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, these are relevant contributions. In fact, however, scientists say that the main pathways of pollution of the oceans are via the land and the air. Other human uses of the ocean and its resources add to marine pollution, dumping of waste, shipping, normal operation and accidents, seabed activities such as the drilling for oil and gas, and noise also qualifies as pollution. If we look at the regulation, oil pollution from ships used to be the main focus of early international law. Public awareness is a relevant issue in this context, and mass media actually helped to spread pictures of major oil pollution incidents. In this respect, international regulation is often reactive. After every tanker catastrophe, regulations got stricter, and international liability funds raised the contributions and the maximum amount of financial resources for damages. After oil pollution, the regulations of other pollution issues followed. It's important that states cooperate in international institutions to tackle the problems and agree on binding standards for all states. If there is binding international law, a state has to implement it into national laws and enforces against ships flying their flag. Let me mention one of the main institutions. The International Maritime Institution is very active in regulating the shipping sector. And under the roof of the IMO, a lot of legally binding instruments have been drafted. In addition to global and regional instruments uh, that we have, uh, with, they deal with different sorts of uh, pollution, pollution from land, from dumping, from seabed activities. It's very important to have such international regulations, but they differ. They differ with regard to the number of states or parties to the relevant treaties. They differ with regard to the substances and with regard to compliance and possible enforcement. It would be best if there was one binding, comprehensive instrument that addressed all different sources of marine pollution. And we have the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but it's only a framework. It only tries to give the broad idea, but it doesn't regulate who is allowed to put what into the ocean. Concerning jurisdiction, imagine you are the captain of a military vessel and you're sailing on the high seas. Suddenly you see a ship in the vicinity that is dumping cask overboard on which you see the symbol for radioactivity. It's absolutely clear that dumping of radioactive waste is prohibited for everybody, everywhere on the ocean. And you, as your military ship, you have the capacity to stop, board, inspect, arrest the vessel. Can you do it? The answer in most cases will be no. Unless the ship who's dumping the waste is uh, under the same flag as you, as a military ship, if uh, you're, you're the same uh, flag, you can arrest that ship. If it's any other ship, you can only inform the state, the flag state, you can inform the authorities, but it's up to them to deal with the problem. The situation is different uh, if we come to waters closer to the coast. There, the coastal states have the capacity and the responsibility, of course, to prohibit such activities. So we have seen that the prevention of pollution of the high seas can be very problematic due to reliance on flag state uh, responsibility. Yet pollution from vessels and dumping is not the main cause of pollution. Pollution from land-based sources are the main contributions to ocean degradation. But there we would need to regulate on land. States would agree, would have to agree to regulate their behavior on land. For example, for agriculture. Agricultural runoff is a big source of pollution of the oceans. 
and states are very, very reluctant to do that. It's easier to regulate shipping. We're all in the same situation. Much uh, easier than to regulate activities on land, where we have different capacities, capabilities of states, and also different interests. If you have a, a large coast with a lot of agriculture, you would be very reluctant to impose uh, strict regulations on your farmers. So um, if states have to impose uh, restrictions on the industry, it gets more difficult. So concerning regulations on land, imagine you were a politician. It would be very difficult to sell the idea to your citizens that they will face economic disadvantages to save the environment if other states continue to pollute the ocean. So the idea behind is that you would need all the states on board so that states agree that they all face the same restrictions. And this is not the situation we have today. We have piecemeal approaches with different states agreeing to different standards, and that makes it more um, difficult. So one consequence of this situation may be that states don't agree on substantive standards, or they don't implement them, so that in essence nothing at all happens to address pollution. And international treaties to prevent pollution from land-based sources exist, but they have a reputation of being very weak. Let us turn to new challenges. We all agree that we need urgent action to stop the further rise in the average global temperature to 2 degrees centigrade to prevent dramatic consequences for our climate. But do we want to risk ocean pollution to achieve this? You may now wonder how these two issues are linked and what the legal, legal regulation has to say on this. First of all, the warming of the water, but also the higher degree of acidity in the water are consequences of greenhouse gas emissions, and they qualify as pollution. So greenhouse gas emissions pollute our oceans. This, however, now is not our focus. We will focus on those means associated with preventing climate change that can affect the ocean. Wouldn't it be convenient if we could use the ocean as a dumping site? for CO2 sequestered in industrial processes? When considering this option in the face of urgent action to combat climate change, we're suddenly back with Hugo Grotius in assuming that the oceans are so vast that they can't be harmed. Currently, the storage of sequestered CO2 in the deep sea, in the water column, or under the seabed is mainly considered dumping, but there are certain exceptions to that. For example, storage of sequestered CO2 in, under, uh, in formations underneath the sea ground where uh, gas or oil have been extracted. Another issue associated with efforts to climate change and new challenges is ocean fertilization. Explained in a simplified way, scientists are trying to induce an algae bloom in the oceans by putting fertilizers like iron into the water, and the ocean, which is the largest natural carbon reservoir, would work as a carbon sink, so CO2 from the atmosphere would be stored. From the legal side, from the perspective of international law, but that's dumping. If you put substances into the water, even if you have a good idea uh, in mind, that can qualify as dumping. And states will now need to deal with that, whether they will allow for such practices or not. At the moment, it's only allowed on the stage of um, experiments of uh, national scientists trying to find out whether it actually works. When we look at the list of uh, uh, sustainable development goals, um, that doesn't uh, help us set our priorities. You see, now we have to find out where are our priorities. Is it the climate or is it saving the environment? And the SDGs doesn't help us. They say, well, we have to stop climate change and we have to use the oceans in a sustainable way. So we're still left with the question of how to get this uh, to work. To summarize these chapters, we have learned that there are many different sources of pollution of the oceans that would be best addressed in an integrated manner in one single instrument. And some, like pollution from ships, are easier to regulate than others, such as pollution from land-based sources, even if we have to deal with exclusive flex state jurisdiction on the high seas. And some activities that are presumably beneficial for the achievement of one environmental objective, such as preventing further climate change, can be a threat to the marine environment, and this makes governance very difficult. 